At a cost of nearly eight and a half million dollars, the Anzacs is a television first in Australia. It will take 400,000 feet of film and nearly three years for the Burroughs Dixon Company to complete the series. The story will trace the lives of a group of soldiers in the 8th Battalion from the time they left Australia to the time the survivors returned home. It's a penetrating account of Australian soldiers in war. It will span five years of unforgettable history, 70 years after the event took place. Do any of you blokes know anything about music? Well, uh, <clears throat> I studied a little, sir. Good. You and your mate, shift that piano into the officer's mess. Get on your way. First lesson, never volunteer for anything. Well, Anzacs is uniquely relevant to modern day Australians for two reasons. It tells us so much of what we were and indicates, therefore, what we have become. It is a story about all Australians, about ordinary Australians, called upon to do extraordinary things. This is the story of every man, not the story of a couple of self-selecting heroes, those one or two people destined by history to perform great feats. This is the exact opposite. This is you and me. It's every man performing under impossible odds against circumstances which should have driven sane men crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, Great Britain has declared war on Germany. That's not, not before time either, either, Rupert. Australia, New Zealand and Canada have announced they will be raising forces immediately. Good, sir. At the outbreak of the Great War in 1914, there were many who expected Australia to raise a ragtag and bobtailed army not fit for anything other than garrison duties. Ah, there's going to be a war! I will not have a Barrington skulking in the outback while the mother country is in peril. By 1918, the critics were either silent or openly expressing their amazement that such a small force could have had so dramatic an impact on the war in Europe. It had been said that Australians lacked sort of discipline and therefore could not make good soldiers. I really don't need to be reminded that the Australians are in France. There have already been reports of theft, disorder in the back areas and South Africa all over again. South Africa? Yes, the colonial hooligans. If by discipline they meant the outward trapping so beloved of European generals, then the critics were right. The volunteer Aussie was openly sceptical about things like saluting for the sake of it. He reserved this for people he respected. And that didn't include the major part of the British officer class. You two men, stand fast there. Don't you salute in your army? Not a lot. Well, we used to, but we're trying to give it up. Fire! They did have another sort of discipline, which was far more effective. Never let your mates down. Cover me! This meant that in the shock of battle, and shock is the right word applied to World War I, they stuck close together and were hard to break. Other armies were just as courageous, but none had the degree of confidence and cohesion that comes from knowing that you can count on your mates. Add one other thing. Leaders were selected from men who had already proved themselves regardless of social background, for Australians would follow no other sort. Of course, uh, the Anzacs never considered themselves anything other than civilians in uniform. The British High Command never understood the Australian attitude until 1918 when they started to A, stop the German from winning the war and B, won the decisive battle. And they only at the last moment realised that the best battle discipline on the whole of the Western Front was with the Australians. These characters who created problems behind the lines, who uh, were seen to uh, uh, not stamp up and down the place, and yet in battle, they were totally cohesive. These qualities came directly from Australian society and marked the AIF as distinct among all other groups in Europe. At the end, when they had suffered the highest casualty rate of any British contingent, they were able to strike a series of blows which led to the collapse of the German army.
Casting of Anzacs presented problems on two levels. First, to find a supply of young actors capable of carrying so many roles. To our joy, that proved easy. Second, and much more important, in finding a cross-section of types capable of portraying all of the variety of the men of the first AIF. Men as different as, for example, the character of Martin Barrington, the son of a Western District squatter, very upper class, and then all the way to Rowley Collins, urban, Catholic, working class, a boot mender. Probably the most difficult character, though, was that of the quintessential Australian larrikin, that one type of Australian that seems to represent to all of us what we would like to be. There is, of course, a type in existence, Paul Hogan. When John was writing Anzacs, he had Paul Hogan in mind for Pat Cleary, but in those early days, we didn't dare think that we could get him. Well, as events turned out, we did. And in landing Paul for the role of Pat Cleary, I think we breathed a, a truth into the characterisation of the first AIF that would have been rather appalling had we not achieved it. I'm not playing a German general or anything, I'm playing Pat Cleary. And he's a typical Aussie larrigan. Uh, he's the kind of bloke that organised the two up and the chook raffles and the sly grog and, and uh, got supplies to the front that the blokes couldn't get through the normal channels and uh, never treated the war seriously at any stage. Uh, therefore he's an important character because all those World War I diggers and two and Vietnam and anywhere else weren't all serious dedicated uh, kill or be killed soldiers. Who said it then? Oh, I don't know, someone behind me somewhere. Well, who gave you permission to speak? You did. You said, what did he say? And I said... Silence! And it was that attitude that, that carried him through a lot of unbelievable conditions. They refused to take it seriously. And uh, the Pat Clearys of that era were the ones that made the Australians different to the, uh, the rest of the troops of the Empire. And they, they stamped the, uh, the Aussie digger on, on you know, world warfare anyway, or, and on Europe as a, as a unique sort of character. Loot! Yeah! Loot? Oh, no, we're just... Mining it for General Haig. See, he's got his name on the bottle. Oh, you say? Boom! One of the first departments to be employed on a television series is the art department. They are responsible for the look of the series. For the research, of course, we spent a lot of time in the War Memorial in Canberra. Um, all of the art department went down there and all of the wardrobe and costume people went there. Went there for a fortnight. And I think we looked at about 100,000 various stills down there to find various points we were looking for. For example, a field phone, a French village, before and after you know, a barrage of artillery. Uh, so we brought a lot of those back and then we pieced them all together to give us a basic idea of what we needed. A battlefield resembles nothing so much as a garbage dump. So the art department raided the local tips to collect a fascinating pile of junk. As the Great War was the first motorised war, it was necessary to reconstruct a fleet of vintage cars and trucks from the ground up. One of these trucks actually made its appearance on the Somme in 1916. More and more, the countryside began to resemble parts of France. A group of farmhouses received the final touch of instant ageing. This is called dressing the battlefield. The art department became experts in selecting the right piece of debris. Likewise, the iron men of the construction department. And so the fields of despair were built up. This is a reconstruction of the area around Passchendaele in Flanders, after the winter rains had set in in 1917. 500,000 British and Dominion troops fell in the Great Push only to be denied victory as the battlefield reverted to the swamp it had once been. Well, it's my opinion that by a number of circumstances, some accidental, some uh, perhaps intellectual, uh, fashionably intellectual, that uh, we've been robbed of a large part of our heritage. Uh, any nation could be proud of what the first AOF did. In fact, it is a saga, a saga that deserves, uh, deserves the status of a legend in anybody's history. 
yet who knows about it in Australia. It somehow got lost in the 30s with the war weariness. There were other factors. The diggers themselves never talked about France. But I do blame historians, school teachers, for robbing us. I think indeed, it's a strong word, but I say robbing us of this heritage. It is hard to avoid superlatives when looking at the first AIF. Marshal Foch certainly didn't. Although our task was never easy, it was made less difficult by the patriotism and passionate valour of the Australians, which serve as an example to the whole world. You saved Amiens. You saved France. When I saw the battlefield, um, several things struck me. Above all, what I realised was that I'd carried an Australian sense of distance to the battlefields, that to us driving 100, 200, 300 kilometres is, uh, is just nothing. And what struck me um, driving out of Amiens towards Villas Bretno was just how short that distance was. It was uh, only a few kilometres and um, I suddenly realised that in fact how many people had died but yet what a very very small area um, the whole war occurred in. Kate, in amongst the shambles of that retreat were some men who hadn't lost their self-respect. Men who were looking for someone to focus their courage. Now what would you expect me to walk out on that? Bloody hell. There's going to be more unprincipled men left alive at the end of this war than the other kind. So? So why should my man be one I'm of... I'm yours, son. Yes, mine. Someone once said that war was nine-tenths boredom and one-tenth sheer fright. Well, filmmaking is a bit like that. Except that, mercifully, the fright is mostly replaced by intense activity. There are long periods when setting up takes place, when everything, people and objects, all have to be in the right spot. In Anzacs, we rarely shot with only one camera. Our record was nine. So here we are on a nice summer's day in July 1916. The boys in high spirits are about to leave their friendly village to march south to the Somme, where fate awaits them. In 1984, however, Murphy's Law prevails. A horse rears from the noise of our melodic troops. The animal is quickly soothed by our producer, and the scene continues. So much of Anzacs involves not just simply the battles. In fact, I suppose that one could say that no more than 10% of each episode concerns a particular battle. What it is more about is the men and the women behind the men in France, in England and at home here in Australia. We see their friends and relatives, their wives and lovers. We're concerned to know what motivates the men, what they have left and what hopefully they will come home to. And we need to know also what sacrifices were made at home by people left behind. How can they bear it? They depend upon one another. They have a fierce brotherhood in which each sustains the other. It's uh, something approaching the Christian ideal. Ironical, isn't it, that war should produce that? Number four section? 
was till you got here. <laughs> no, I was, a, I was a real McCoy soldier. Yeah, I never fired a shot in anger. I, mean, I was on sort of like third line reserves to go to Vietnam. So, you know, I sort of know all about, well, not all about, but I'm an old digger myself. I'm in, I'm in sympathy and, uh, and that was useful in this series because I was never a stranger to the weapons or the uniform or the discipline or the boredom, which, which goes on with the army, except when you're being shot at. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! They're Australians! Bullshit! I cannot just stand by while Hay presents another butcher's bill. There it is, is a cruel and wasteful business. One way, Prime the diggers knew that at first hand. You but they also knew it had to be fought. Offensive. But on conditions such as that each step of the offensive be a success before he can go on. They died in vain, cried the intellectuals from their studies after the war. In fact, they're still saying it. Common sense is often a quality lost in the process of higher education, and the common sense of the average digger told him clearly he was defending a society quite different to the one the German generals had in mind. You disgraceful woman. You know Martin would have done anything for Dick. Anything. And where do you think Martin is now? In some safe place behind the line? The of music in Anzacs was quite amazing. Things ranging from uh, ballroom music and sort of uh, Australian country aristocracy, if you like, to elegant dinner parties involved, to English clubs, to uh, Gallipoli, where you've got lots of, uh, I've tried to do, add quite a few Turkish overtones, which sort of tell you roughly where you are, to obvious war themes. There's the three different love themes, there's three romantic interests, a hell of a range. In creating the music, I, I, it comes from different areas. I, I tend to try and go on, on location a lot to talk to uh, actors, actresses, as far as how they feel about a character, which helps me as far as putting it, their musical feeling into, into perspective. Obviously, looking at the pictures are the most inspiring because you have something to work with as far as sight and sound and feeling of how the scene is or is meant to go. It's then up to you as a composer to try and work out how you can enhance it or how, if necessary, sometimes you may want to completely change the direction of the scene musically. Mademoiselle Fifi, Mademoiselle Colette et Mademoiselle Claudine. Are they all for me, Pat? Yeah, happy birthday, Put. <laughs> Well, the main difference between Anzacs and uh, most miniseries that I've done is it's just enormous. The, the fact that there's a huge cast and crew, double unit, for uh, most of the 15 weeks just meant transporting people and recreating the First World War is not easy for special effects. It's just enormous. Being a, a film about the First World War, of course, there was uh, quite a few battles in there, ranging from as many as 800 people in one scene storming across a hill to where a battle had taken place and following it on five miles ahead were, of course, hard. We covered areas of trench warfare, as in Lone Pine, where the Australians stormed uh, Lone Pine only to find Turks looking up at them, and they took that Lone Pine. It was one of the greatest uh, military achievements of the time. We did sections like Lone Pine too in the mud and that was extremely difficult because you always had a lot of, a lot of people to control and a lot of special effects because of the bombs and, and what have you and placing those was very hard. Guys, the boys are over this side. 
the hours that we worked were very long, so it required uh, a lot of discipline from the cast and crew. Uh, when you're putting in 12 to 14 hours a day in the rain and the mud, you all have to keep together. And of course, there's three directors doing it, and the crew had to adjust for each director. The story of Anzacs, insofar as Gallipoli is concerned, is easily understood. It was a small, contained campaign involving a pretty insignificant number of people compared to the Western Front. I think it's almost a national laziness that enables us to deal with Gallipoli. But the Western Front is altogether different. German army out there. I don't see how they can be any better than old Johnny Turk. Of course they bloody are. This line hasn't advanced in a year and a half. The battles in France and Belgium involved millions and millions of men. Armies from all over the world. Professional armies. The Australians had only 300,000 over there. Yet they were as significant as any other national force in forcing the final victory. But the path to that victory has defied historians pretty well of all nations. By the time the Anzacs arrived there in 1916, millions of men were entrenched from the North Sea to the Swiss border. And the enemies faced each other across a narrow gap called No Man's Land. Not short of guns here, Sarge. The side who could work out how to cross this space, then break through, would win the war. This war is in the balance. The federal captain had been told by London that if the reinforcement rate is not stepped up, they may have to disband one of our divisions. Perhaps instead, they should think about conserving our soldiers. Spoken like an armchair strategist. Rupert! No. My knowledge of the casualties comes painfully at first hand. Anyway, what are we arguing about? This war changes a lot of things. A couple of questions, Sir Douglas. From the map, the Posier's position looks less than a mile wide. The concentration of artillery in that small space must be very heavy indeed. Uh, perhaps the heaviest of the war. And our casualties must inevitably reflect this. In 1916, the British threw half a million partly trained men against the Germans on the Somme into a storm of artillery fire not equaled since. In a narrow space of a few miles, battalions were pulverized by a million shells and the gain was only two or three miles. It is all too possible that we may lose this war. The Germans have broken through on two fronts now. Breakthrough, you say? The German generals had planned for 30 years to knock out France with a sweep through Belgium to Paris. They almost succeeded, but they had overlooked the development of modern weapons. The magazine rifle, the machine gun, and the high explosive shell. These weapons gave enormous power to the defenders. That, gentlemen, is why there's a continuous trench from the North Sea to the Swiss border. As long as the machine gun's intact, Neither side can cross no man's land. Our enemy, the German army, is extremely skillful in their use of it. Their gunners are hand-picked, and they use them like this. in good time. <laughs> no, not that. I mean a cigarette. Smoking? Sister Baker, you are a loose, loose woman. <laughs> Aren't you the lucky one, then? <laughs> so how long's this been going up for? Oh, since you seduced <laughs> me. <laughs> 
in the Anzacs, uh, the basic weapons were the Mauser rifle, the Lee Enfield rifle, uh, belonging to the two major warring factions, uh, plus their associated machine guns. Uh, on set, at any one time, we probably had uh, 300 Lee Enfields, 45 Mauser rifles, some eight machine guns, a dozen pistols, all of which were firing. Uh, the major problem was, of course, keeping them clean, functioning, had to go any time for any scene. Basically, with the machine guns, there was no difference whether they were regular soldiers or actors. They still needed instruction. The regs are just not used to those type of weapons. They handle the latest ones fine. The working action of the Maxims, the Lewis guns, had to be explained. They know the basics, they've got the best grounding. Just that little bit of work was required. <laughs> no, I was so close, if only I looked around. Oh, no, no. Oh, I've seen as much death as you have. It did I change know. a lot for women, the war, because it, it, for the first time they were asked to go to the battlefields to, to actually work with the soldiers and they were about, you know, times 20 miles away from the guns and the fighting. So that put a, a large responsibility on the women to be a lot tougher. I think it's going to be the same after all this. Let's all face up to it now. Well, I think the biggest challenge in playing Kate was the fact that, I, I mean, I'm not a 1914 woman and she had to be and yet she had to be stronger than most 1914 ladies really were to make her a, a viable character for us and uh, that was the challenge keeping her in period but keeping her much stronger than possibly somebody would have been in that that time Daniel Martin, oh, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Not here, not... Love, the war's almost over. Another push, the Germans will be... The biggest impression I got is not, 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 there's not enough of a legend of the Anzacs. I mean, all we ever heard about World War One was Gallipoli, and that's all we've ever made films on, and all you learned about at school, and that's where the boys got beat. Well, that was only the first year of the war, and there's another four years after that where the true Anzac legend was born. Bloody counterattack! Forward at the double! Filming of Anzacs uh, presented uh, special effects problems of both old and new. Uh, the old ones producing large numbers of uh, explosions close to actors, a lot of actors, a lot of extras, sometimes as many as 300 people on the set, plus crew, plus observers coming in from time to time. A lot of people on the set at times who weren't familiar with explosions and uh, with working near them. This required an approach that uh, would ensure safety without slowing down the filming of the project. We were filming 10 hours of, uh, of war for television and the amount of time that would normally be taken for about 90 minutes of uh, feature film. And, and therefore we had to work fast and efficiently and, uh, and still take no chances with people's safety. The biggest challenge for me was becoming a soldier 
for the series. But luckily, before the shooting commenced, we had a two-week workshop period, which was basically a military reorientation exercise so that all the actors could become familiar with the weapons involved, military etiquette, uh, how to give and take an order, uh, battle formations, etc. And also, we were given lectures on how specific battle scenes that the series deals with were staged both geographically and strategically. So I was very lucky, as all the actors were, to have that period to become adjusted to the life of a soldier. In 1917, the British went over to the attack again, this time in Ypres. It became another murderous artillery battle, and just when it seemed to bog down, the Anzacs divisions went in and won a series of brilliant victories. The Germans, it seemed, were at the end of their tether. But it was too late in the season. The rains came down and the whole area churned up by shell fire reverted to the bog it had once been. Men drowned in flooded shell holes. I have a lot of empathy now with what those guys went through in World War I. I never really thought about it before. I've sort of never done World War I history. But now, we only went through a minor amount of uh, the action that those guys went through. And of course, we had blankets to wrap around ourselves after each take, whereas those guys just had to stay out there in the cold and the mud and the, the crap and so forth. So I just don't know how they did it. I don't know how those men survived. I really don't. I don't know a damn thing about you anymore. <laughs> How can you say that? Well, when I came here, you didn't kiss me. You didn't even hey, say hello. What are you talking about? That's right after the war. We've got to finish it first. By we, you mean you, personally. Maybe I do, I mean. I don't know anymore. I've been fighting for three and a half years now. Just like me. in the way of our fine young men. Temptation? Strong drink is an evil thing. It destroys homes and families. You wowsers give me the willies. Who are we sending all this stuff to? A bunch of fighting men or a pack of lily-livered bloody sissies? Hello, hello, who's your lady friend? Who's the little girlie by your side? I've seen you with a girl or two. Hello, hello, stop your little games Don't you think your ways you want to mend It isn't the girl I saw you with at Brighton Who, who, who's your lady friend? My job as stunt coordinator on this series was to break down the, uh, break down the scenes that required the action, put the right bodies in there who could do the action, look after the artists, at all times, look after them to make sure they were comfortable and they were safe when they were hurling themselves from trench holes, from trenches to shell holes, etc., and across the barbed wire. And make sure that the whole shoot worked safely, the action worked convincingly. It has to look realistic, even though it's a fantasy, it still has to look realistic because the public buy realism. And basically, my position was to put this action onto the screen with the director. When training stuntmen and saps, these are stunt action personnel who are um, apprentice stuntmen, one has to get involved with them and show them how it is done. They have to act, especially when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting or using props, i.e. rifles or missiles, anything like this. They've got to know how to, as we say in the business, wear them. So if I was to hit anybody with a, with a prop, with an instrument, they have to know how to sell it. And it's showing them how to sell it. And with new people, 
when you teach them stunt work, you get an experienced stunt man to get stuck into, say myself, with fists and boots. You sell it and then look at their faces. In 1918, the Germans were able to bring back their army from the Russian front following the revolution. These fresh troops faced a French army slowly recovering and a British army bled white at Ypres. The Germans saw their chance and took it. They struck on the Somme, where tired divisions were resting. The British front lines disappeared under a storm of shells and the German storm troops skillfully worked their way to the rear. The front trembled and broke up. The Germans were Russians. heading for Amiens and victory. The odds have swung dangerously in Germany's favour. It's obvious they intend to go for a knockout blow at an early date. I trust that whatever the future holds, we will both be able to say we did all in our power to guard against a catastrophe. In the uh, wild emergencies of the German offensive in March and April 1918, when the Germans came within an ace of winning the war, the five Australian divisions, which consisted of only 10% of the British forces, held over 30% of the line, and they stabilised it, particularly at a place called Hazebrook, who's heard of that, and a place called Villas Bretno, some people have heard of that. And uh, they stopped the Germans winning the war. The war had yet to be won, but that was another story. Australians marched up through a broken army and roads clogged with refugees. On seeing them, many of the French civilians turned around and went home, for they remembered Les Australiens from 1916. We do not worry now. It is safe to go home. The diggers met the German spearhead in open country near the village of Villers Breton. In a series of swirling engagements, the enemy were stopped and then sent reeling. The crisis of the war was over, France was saved. Then at last, the Australian divisions were grouped together under the command of General Monash. Monash was described by a British historian as a first-class general in charge of first-class troops. From today, the five Australian divisions will be grouped into one army corps with an Australian commander. This has taken nearly four years to achieve. From now on, we fight side by side. The combination was irresistible. He struck first at Hamel and broke a German division in 90 minutes. Then a month later, with the whole corps, he repeated the exercise at Amiens. Monash combined as no other his men, planes, tanks and guns with the aim of both winning and conserving soldiers. Amiens was the greatest victory of that war. The Australians and their Canadian neighbours broke through for five miles on the first day. The beleaguered allies took heart of this stunning turn in the fortunes of war. A general advance began and the Germans sued for peace in October. It was said by the Germans themselves that this was the black day of the German army. Now this was uh, something extraordinary from a small force of the first AIF, particularly in the sense that, of the casualties they'd already taken. Um, it's another little known fact that they had the highest casualty rate of any of the British contingents in First World War. Yet, right at the end, they were able to strike a decisive blow. And from that day, the German army did not stop retreating. The Anzacs is about the ordinary Australian who, when called upon, did extraordinary things. He should not have been forgotten for so long, but then he didn't write books about himself. He disappeared thankfully back into civilian life, for he was always a civvy in uniform, even though paradoxically one of the best soldiers ever seen. He rarely spoke about that terrible war, and only emerged once a year on Anzac Day. Even for this, he was often criticised, 
as if meeting your surviving mates and remembering your dead ones was somehow being pro-war. He mostly shrugged, knowing that fools have as much right to exist as any other in the society he defended. In 1978, a small group of old men, all veterans of the AIF, approached Amiens Cathedral on the 60th anniversary of the end of the Great War. As they entered this huge place, they were touched to find the cathedral packed in their honor. If Australians forget, the French don't. The Archbishop quoted from an address their mates had heard over half a century ago. We bow to you, Monsieur les Australiens, for the magnificent deeds you did in those days now happily at an end. The soil of France is transformed to a new divinity by your sacrifices. In the whole of history, we cannot find an army more marvelous in its bravery. And in the war, there were none who contributed more nobly to the final triumph. When armies to the right and left of them crumbled, as they did in 1918, somehow this depleted band forged the decision of that war and we should be told of it. These guys, the original Anzacs, the World War I fellas, they were the, uh, they had the, uh, the spirit and the courage that we all think we've got. If Anzacs has one clear task, it is to make Australians feel immensely proud of themselves. It is to see themselves in a new light, in a confident light in a triumphant light, but not in a bragging or tub-thumping light. Just think of it. A few thousand Australians travelled 12,000 miles across to another continent and, and decisively affected the outcome of the struggle over there. But more important than that, they brought to it the qualities of the land that had bred them. Now, and these were, and I still believe, are unique, and this is what Australians should be reminded of. Anzacs, I hope, will also cause all of us to never again look at the diggers marching on Anzac Day and fail to understand. I hope like hell that the next time anyone out there sees the diggers, that they will know these men and that they will love these men for what they did, for what they were and for what they still are.